And now for everybody else here today, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join me while I talk to you a little bit about my doctoral research. And give me just a moment so I share my screen with everybody. You see my, my lovely background right there. All right. There we go. Can everybody see that all right? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Alrighty, so we have a very diverse crowd here today. And before we dive headfirst into my research, I wanna give everybody a quick conceptual overview of correlative ecological niche modeling. From there, I'll discuss my efforts to develop a baseline of model performance using traditional time average niche modeling methods. Then I'll delve into how I approached incorporating time into the established niche modeling framework. And finally, I'll walk you through an application of this modified workflow and discuss the implications of these improvements. So correlative ecological niche models, also commonly referred to as ecological niche models and species distribution models, are part of a suite of statistical analyses that use species observation data and relevant environmental covariates to estimate a species and uh, ecological niche and project that estimation onto the geographic landscape for a selected study period. Typically, the resulting continuous prediction is thresholded to produce a binary map of predicted suitability. So correlative niche models can actually be quite flexible and are commonly used in movement ecology studies focusing on individuals, populations, or groups, as well as in distributional ecology studies, which tend to focus on species level applications. Their explicit linkage of geographic and environmental spaces can help render conservation planning more understandable and accessible to a variety of stakeholders. As such, application of these met methods ranges from evaluating habitat preferences and distributions to assessing invasive potential. They're even used to address more broad scale biogeographic questions as well as issues of public health. And just to be clear, today we'll be, be strictly discussing niche models in a distribution ecology or species level context. So now that we have a basic understanding of what niche models are, let's take a quick look at the basic niche modeling framework. So I snagged this workflow from Zarel et al, and we'll reference it occasionally throughout today's talk. When we're, when we're starting any niche modeling project, we first have to identify the modeling context. That is, we need to clearly specify the who, what, when, where, why, and how of our study. The second step, that of selecting, collecting, cleaning, and curating all of the data going into our models is typically the most labor intensive uh, and time consuming portion of the process. After ensuring that all of our input data are up to standard, we engage in the model fitting and selection process. This is where we iteratively select our final model covariates, assess a suite of algorithm appropriate parameterizations to identify the best model fit, and if appropriate, generate model ensembles or consensus models. We then assess our final models using measures of statistical performance as well as overall plausibility, which is essentially an expert level reality check. And finally, if necessary, we can project our models to novel environments. In traditional approaches to niche modeling, all covariate data are time averaged. That is, the data for each covariate is summarized over the course of the study period. This effectively provides a single static snapshot of each environmental variable selected. Essentially, you end up with a single value in each pixel across the study region, summarizing the full study period for each covariate. Naturally, there are some limitations inherent in these time average niche modeling approaches. In particular, time averaging of covariates over extensive timeframes leads to an overgeneralization and a loss of environmental extremes. This ultimately results in the failure of time averaged methods to capture completely the full environmental niche of species that move regularly over large geographic distances. Think migratory species, but this also might include, include poorly sampled species, rare species, and species that are difficult to detect, which not surprisingly often coincides with species of elevated conservation concern. With these issues in mind, I crafted my dissertation research to begin addressing some of these shortcomings. Specifically, I wanted to improve the predictive capacity of niche models for migratory species by introducing a series of modifications to the established modeling framework. Further, I wanted to ensure equity of access to these enhanced methodologies and thus relied solely on open access data and open source programs for my analyses. I chose to focus my analyses on seabirds for three reasons. First, because they spend a large proportion of their lives on the ocean, seabirds serve as indicators of the overall health of marine systems. Second, there is significant conservation concern. 
Seabirds only comprise about three and a half percent of all bird species, and yet they're one of the most globally threatened groups, with approximately one third of the 359 species listed as threatened. And finally, there really are a lot of data available for seabirds, at least quantitatively speaking. All right, so now that we're caught up on the basics, I want to come clean on something. Y'all, I did not come into my doctoral research with grand dreams of embarking on any kind of, of methodological improvements to anything. In fact, I had intention, initially intended to run a series of niche models for a suite of pelagic seabirds to be incorporated into a spatial prioritization assessment. I was particularly interested in helping to fill knowledge gaps of at-sea distributions for non-breeding pelagic seabirds, as much of our knowledge about pelagic seabird distributions is limited to breeding individuals and populations. But as is often the case when doing research, I almost immediately ran headfirst into a major obstacle, which altered my focus from conservation applications to methods development. So let's talk about this a bit. For my initial set of analyses, I chose the wandering albatross. They're a fairly iconic species, easily recognized by their massive size, and their white plumage, uh, Certainly everybody here remembers Orville the Albatross from Disney's The Rescuers. Um, these, are, these birds are slow to mature, long-lived subantarctic pelagic species that once they've fledged, return to, their, return to one of five subantarctic island colonies only to breed. I obtained wandering albatross data and data for the entire Diomedeidae family from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF. A massive amount of data were available, and even after cleaning and curation of the data, I had more than 9,500 water and albatross occurrence points for use in analyses, and more than 100,000 Diomedeidae occurrences from which to derive a pseudo-absence data set. And because at the time I was interested in at-sea or non-breeding distributions, part of the data cleaning process meant excluding some wandering albatross data. Unfortunately, information about age, sex, and breeding status aren't commonly available for open access occurrence data. This lack of information meant that the data I removed from analyses were chosen based on a geographic location alone. That is, I excluded data at the more northerly and southerly extremes of the distribution, as those areas tend to be more commonly occupied by juveniles and breeding males. I acquired data for three dynamic environmental covariates captured by NASA's MODIS Terra sensor for the period of February 2000 for the end of 2013, and used these dynamic data excuse me, use these dynamic data alongside NOAA's ETOPA-1 static bathymetry layer. All right, now seasonal niche modeling, or the focusing of time average models to a particular season, is the standard approach used for modeling mobile species such as seabirds. So I use this method to develop my models. To do this, I designated three distinct species seasons, loosely based on the breeding biology of the wandering albatross. These seasons roughly correlated to egg laying and incubation, regard and fledging. I then generated summary climate data for each season by calculating the mean, maximum, minimum, and range for each of my three, three dynamic covariates. I reduced collinearity by, redu by running a principal components analysis on the summary covariate data for each season and retained the first five PCAs for use in analyses. And finally, I delineated a model calibration region for each of the three seasons, which are illustrated in green on the maps on the right. All right, I'm not gonna talk too much or go into too much detail about the modeling itself. So if you really want the nitty gritty, we can talk about that later. But really, I just wanted to give you an overview of the process. For each of my three seasons, I calibrated three statistical algorithms, Maxent, minimum volume ellipsoids, and boosted regression trees. I selected the single best model for each algorithm and season using two metrics, emission rate, which is the percentage of test data incorrectly predicted absent by the model as a key measure of model predictive performance, and PROC, or the partial re receiver operating characteristic as a measure of statistical significance. After projecting the selected models to the full study region, I thresholded the continuous outputs to produce binary suitab suitability maps using a minimum trading presence threshold adjusted to permit 20% of error in the data. And finally, I assessed the final threshold of models on four metrics, omission rate, PROC, the percent, of area of, percent area of relevant marine important bird areas, or IBAs, predicted suitable by the model, and most importantly, the overall pl plausibility of the model predictions themselves.
Now, all of the model calibrations were statistically significant. That is, they performed better than expected at random. But model performance dropped by 50% after the models were transferred to the study region, with less than a third performing better than random. Maxent and BRT models incorrectly predicted well over half of all wandering albatross test data, and even the MVEs predicted no less than 24% of data as absent, although they did accurately predict all of the marine IBAs. So statistically, these models already don't look all that great. But I did say that statistical performance is only one part of the equation. And indeed, visually assessing the plausibility of a model can sometimes tell us much, much more than statistics alone. So let's look at them. Ouch. Okay, let me orient you to this figure a bit. In each of these model projections, we're viewing the Southern Hemisphere from above Antarctica. The seasonal results for each algorithm are presented in each row with BRTs on the top, Maxent in the middle, and MVEs on the bottom. All of the green you see are areas predicted suitable by each model, and the tan regions are, much, are, are areas predicted unsuitable. Let's start with the bottom row, the, MVEs predict, the MVE predictions for each season. All three essentially predicted the entire southern hemisphere as suitable, including the rele relevant marine IBAs um, denoted by the hatched polygons. And yet they still failed to accurately predict more than a quarter of test data. The other two algorithms didn't fare much better. They both predicted vast, the vast majority of the study region as suitable, but omitted even larger proportions of the test data and marine IBAs. To be fair, the Maxent models do come closer visually to recreating the known distribution of wandering albatrosses than the other two algorithms, but that's all relative. And all in all, these models were pretty awful. Nevertheless, chapter one really highlighted the limitations of time averaged modeling. In particular, the decline in model quality resulting from the overgeneralization of environmental data and the need for a modeling methodology that accounts for the variation of environments through time. And unsurprisingly, this also marks the point where my research focus really shifted from thinking about modeling applications to modeling improvements. And also where I finally understood why Town laughed at me when I first told him my original PhD research ideas. All right. So, so as my research focus shifted, my first set of pelagic seabird distribution models became baseline models. And now came the challenging part. You see, modeling mobile species presents a particularly challenging situation. Because to be meaningful, our models must capture both a seasonally dynamic landscape and the associated species movements. So how do we go about making this happen without cluttering our framework or making it overly complex? An important thing to remember is that predictive capacity and reliability of niche models is a direct reflection of the quality of data used. In other words, what you're putting in is directly reflected in what you get out. So that's where I directed my focus, the challenge of data preparation. So with that in mind, let me quickly run you through the data preparation process for traditional time average niche modeling approaches. We'll start first with our species occurrence data. First, we acquire primary species occurrence data, both for the study species and for the reference group that will be used to generate a pseudolapsins data set. These point data are typically acquired as a table of observations, where each row includes the species name, date of observation or collection, and geographic location for an individual observation. Those data are then carefully cleaned to ensure that they're error-free. Basically, we're checking to make sure that there are no inconsistencies or inaccuracies in the taxonomy or coordinate data, that no data are missing, that all collection dates fall within the study period, and so forth. Then, based on our knowledge about the study species, we define a model calibration or training region. This area should include all areas that were accessible to and likely sampled by the study species during the designated study period. The occurrence data outside the model calibration region are removed. Then, because absence data are unavailable for the vast majority of species, we generate a pseudo absence data set. To do this, we use a reference group, which is comprised of species sampled in, in the same manner as our study species. 
In doing this, we ensure that the pseudoabsence data set we create reflects the same sampling bias found in the study species data. Finally, we spatially verify the study species occurrences and the pseudoabsence data to a single point per pixel. That helps to alleviate some of the sampling bias that are inherent in, op in open access data. All right, so our occurrence data are cleaned and we've generated a pseudoabsence data set. Now for our covariate data. After carefully selecting which environmental covariates are relevant to our study species, we must then access the data and standardize them to the desired spatial resolution. The data are then processed to generate summary climate layers for the full breadth of the study period. Minimum, maximum, mean, and range are fairly standard, but these are, these are by no means the only options available. Those summary covariate data are then extracted to the study species occurrences and pseudoabsence data so that each occurrence or data point is associated with a single summary value per covariate. And finally, the study species occurrences and pseudoabsence data are randomly subset into two sets of data, one to be used in model fitting and the other set aside for, in, for use in final model evaluation. So generally, this is the way hundreds of papers have approached these questions. But I want to point out two big issues. First, almost no one prepares their covariate data, just as I described. That is, most don't download higher temporal resolution data and custom generate their own climate summary layers for their specific study period. Instead, most studies use pre-processed climate data that summarize a broad period of time, often much broader than the study period itself. And perhaps the most well known is WorldClim, which provides summary climate data for 1970 to 2000, I believe. And second, the species observation data used are often acquired over multiple decades of sampling. These data are lumped together and assigned only a single value for each covariate for the full breadth of that period. But we all know that even in the same geographic location, the environment varies greatly between each season and across years. Now, I want to show you how I envisioned modifying this. I identified three discrete points in the time average data preparation workflow where I could make key modifications without altering the overall workflow. These points are the method by which we generate pseudoabsence data, the method by which we verify occurrence and pseudoabsence data, and the method by which we treat our covariate data. So let's consider modification one, the method by which we generate our pseudoabsence data. Time averaged approaches generate a pseudoabsence data set, sometimes called a bias layer, based on all reference group data simultaneously, creating a pseudoabsence data set reflective of spatial sampling only. To consider time in this process, for each time step, we can isolate reference group occurrences and generate a kernel density or, or even use a simple decay function from which we can take a weighted sample. The collective weighted sampling from all time steps will then, be, will then comprise a pseudoabsence data set or bias cloud that's re representative of sampling effort across geographic space and time. The second point of modification is the process by which we rarify our study species and pseudoabsence data. In traditional approaches, these data are reduced to a single point per pixel relative to the spatial resolution of the covariate data. As with the pseudoabsence data set, this method only addresses the spatial component of sampling bias. Instead, we can spatially verify data to a single point per pixel per time step, which actually retains a greater amount of data for use in analyses relative to the time averaged approach, and it addresses sampling bias in both the spatial and temporal dimensions. And finally, the third modification point is, re is related to the processing of our covariate data. Rather than genera generating summary climate layers for the full breadth of the study period, or for a particular season within the study period, covariate data are instead left at the na native resolution or processed to match the duration of the selected time step. Then, for each time step, the appropriate co covariate data are extracted to the temporally corresponding occurrences and pseudoabsence data, such that each data point is associate associated with the covariate from the time of sampling as well as the geographic location. Now, the benefit of, excuse me, the benefit of this is twofold. First, generalization of covariates is reduced and resulting, and resulting in models more likely to capture the environmental extremes of our study species. And second, during model transfer, the final selected model is projected to the covariate data for each individual time step, 
which can then be thresholded and combined to produce a dynamic view of predicted suitability through time rather than, rather than a single static prediction. All right, so I had a plan. Now I had to select the appropriate species to test these modifications with. And ultimately, I chose to test my proposed workflow modifications with the wood thrush, a cute little brown songbird with a predictable seasonal migration between summer breeding areas in the northeastern US and southeastern Canada and wintering grounds in the southeastern Mexico and Central America, and for which an obscene amount of observation data are available, as you can see by the annual accumulation of records on the right. In fact, I had so much data that I actually had to reduce the study period from 1980 to, 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 through 2015 to 1980 through 2010. After cleaning, I still had well over 130,000 wood thrush records and more than 800,000 records from the reference group Turtoday to generate my time-specific pseudo-absence data set for the 1980 to 2010 study period, which you can see on the right. So as not to waste all that extra data, however, I set aside wood thrush data from 2014 to 2015 to use as an additional model evaluation data set. To compare the traditional time average workflow with the modified workflow, I created two independent data sets. First, I generated a time average data set by rarifying the occurrence and pseudo absence data to a single point per pixel relative to the spatial resolution of the covariate data. I then created a time-specific data set using the modified spatial and temporal rarification method of reducing the data to a single point per pixel per time step. And you'll note that the spatial temporal rarification process retained more than double the amount of study species occurrences for the primary study period and not quite double the amount of occurrences for the supplemental evaluation period. For simplicity, I used three, model, three monthly covariates from Terra Climate, Precipitation, and Minimum and Maximum Temperature. Then, as with the occurrence data, I prepared two separate environmental data sets. First, I created two time average summary data sets that included mean and range of each covariate. <clears throat> the first climate, data, climate summary data were for 1980, 20, the 1980 to 2010 study period, and the, set, uh, the second set was the additional 2014 to 2015 model evaluation period. For the time-specific modeling, I left the covariate data at monthly resolution. And I followed the same basic model fitting and assessment processes as with chapter one for these time averaged and time-specific scenarios. That is, I fit a suite of models for three algorithms. In this case, generalized linear models, generalized additive models, and BRTs. I used the Kayake information cri criterion, mean squares estimate, and omission rate for within algorithm evaluation and selection, and thresholded each selected model using a minimum training presence threshold adjusted to allow for 1% of error in the data. And finally, I evaluated the final six models, three time averaged and three time specific, using omission rate, PROC, percent area predicted suitable, and of course, plausibility. First, let's talk about emission rates. Looking at the table, you can see that overall emission rates were effectively the same for two of the three algorithms for both time averaged and time specific models. There's an interesting spike in the time specific BRT model projections for the 1980 to 2010 study period, but that's likely the result of strong, uh, strong, temporal, bias, excuse me, strong temporal bias in the observation data. Now let's look at the area predicted suitable. Using the, using the GAM models as an example. Looking at the graph on the right, you'll see that the, that month is along the x-axis, and the vertical axis is the percent, percentage of the, area, the study region predicted suitable by the model. The larger colored blocks provide some general context to wood thrush behavior with typical wintering months in blue, breeding months in yellow, and periods of migration between wintering and breeding ranges in orange. So first, let's look at those two horizontal dashed lines. These represent the static model predictions of the time average GAM for 1980 to 2010 in blue in the additional 2014 to 2015 evaluation period in red. Then notice the vertical lines of black, black points and red diamonds. Uh, the black points represent the proportion of the study area predicted suitable by the time specific model for each individual month in the 1980 to 2010 study period. 
the red diamonds denote the 2014 to 2015 evaluation period. Through these, you can see a consistent relative change in the proportion of study area predicted suitable through time, ranging from less than 10% of the study region during the wintering months, all the way up to 80 to 90% during the summer, pointing to the dynamic nature of the distributional area of the wood thrush. But here's the real question. What does this actually look like on the map? Generally, all three time average models successfully captured the breadth of the wood thrush's core distribution, which you can see here in green for both GAN, GAN projections uh, with the 1980 to 2010 projections on the left and the 2014 to 2015 projections on the right. None of the time average models were able to predict into known areas of vagrancy, and most importantly, the static nature of these models don't reflect the dynamic nature of the wood thrush's distribution. But with just a few modifications to the traditional modeling framework that, that account for when wood thrush observation data were collected in addition to where, my models were able to capture those dynamic distributions. And indeed, if you watch the green, uh, green areas, which reflect the areas predicted suitable by the model, you can see that the time-specific models adequately predicted the wood thrush's core, core geographic extent and beyond to include areas of known vagrancy. So I want to give you a few moments to kind of watch how the, the models progress through time and you can see you can see the trends within. And as, it, as you watch this progression, you should be able to see that the area predicted suitable expanding northward towards the summer months and then retracting southward to the, uh, to the southern US, southeastern Mexico and Central America uh, during the wintering time and so forth. All right, so I've walked you through a conceptual background of correlative niche models, acquainted you with my not so favorite time average baseline models, and taken you through a series of data preparation modifications to incorporate time uh, and illustrated the potential of those modifications using a species with a predictable season movement seasonal movement pattern. So now let's come back to my original study species where seasonal time average modeling methods produce less than stellar results. Again, I accessed a current data from GBIF, from which I created a pseudo absence data set for the same 20, 000, 2000 to 2013 study period. Those paying attention might notice that there are more occurrence data here than were available for my first chapter. This is due in part to the fact that I re-accessed the data prior to the study. So additional data sets are included here that weren't previously available. And I didn't attempt to limit data to a single behavior phase as it was done in chapter one. I created a time-specific pseudo-absence data set following the method introduced in Chapter 2, and I used the same covariate data that I used in Chapter 1 to enable comparison between the two studies. I generated a summary data set consisting of the mean and range for the three dynamic covariates for time-averaged analyses, and I used the original monthly modus data for time-specific analyses. To reduce overfitting of my models resulting from sampling bias, I explored three methods of verification. I spatially verified time average data and spatially and temporally verified time specific data. However, because there was such strong sampling bias in the Wander and Albatross data, I applied a second filter to both sets of occurrence data to thin heavily sampled time steps. Again, I used the same model fitting process that I showed you previously. Although this time I adjusted model thresholds to account for up to 5% in the er error in the data. But what I really want you to see here is that I took the final thresholded models for each, u each unique temporal and verification scenario and generated a median consensus model. This process left me with four binary median consensus models to evaluate, which I did using omission rate, PROC, ability to predict relevant marine IBAs, and of course, plausibility. And to facilitate visual assessment of each model's ability to predict known areas of importance to the wandering albatross, I overlaid on each consensus model the range extent of the wandering albatross, relevant marine IBAs, and the major southern ocean fronts, including the subtropical front, subantarctic front, and polar front.
Now, you'll remember that I wasn't particularly happy with the seasonal models from chapter one for this problematic species. Well, the emission rates for this set of type I and neither consensus model performs statistically better than random. Both times specific consensus models, however, had significantly lower emission rates, emitting only 2.5% and 5.5% of wandering albatross test data, which is pretty awesome. But before we all get too excited, we have to actually look at the model predictions. And both time averaged models are pretty terrible. Again, we're looking down at the southern hemisphere from above Antarctica. And the light blue regions are the areas predicted suitable by each model. What you can see is that the spatially rarefied time averaged model on the left actually predicted areas well beyond the known wandering out dis distribution denoted by the dotted black lines as suitable while incorrectly predicting much of the known range and relevant IVAs as unsuitable. Interestingly, the results of the spatially rarefied and thin model on the right are reminiscent of the MVE predictions from chapter one predicting the vast majority of the Southern Hemisphere as suitable, yet still omitting more than 20% of the test data. And I pretty much feel the same about these time averaged models as I do about those from chapter one. So what about the time specific consensus models? Well, considering that I did not incorporate the single greatest environmental constraint on the one or albatross's distribution, These, and not only do they look good, but they suggest that the modifications I introduced to the data preparation workflow to incorporate time have great potential for modeling even the most troublesome migratory species. All right, we get it. I'm pleased with the results. So why am I so excited about these time-specific models? I'll, I'll give you some time to observe for yourself, but if you watch the correspondence between suitable areas in light blue, and the red points that are the test data, you'll see that in neither model do we have the issue, you'll see that in neither, excuse me, you'll see that in neither model do we have the issue of the entire Southern Hemisphere being projected as suitable. And that the overall predictions, they're not overly weird. They actually kind of make some sense. Now, both models do predict areas north of the known distributional extent of the species to be suitable. But that's not altogether unsurprising given that we use the same environmental data as used in the time averaged models. Also, the few test data emitted by each of these models tended to coincide with areas of sharp, sharp bathymetric relief, so right along coastal shelves or in areas where lots of, with lots of variation on the ocean floor, and which are likely issues that are almost certainly a reflection of the high, high spatial resolution used in the modeling. So really, what's today's take home message? In short, traditional time averaged modeling approaches are just too general, particularly for migratory and other highly mobile species. In the process of summarizing our data, we lose the complexity of the relationship between occurrences and the environment through time. This has really strong implications for species that tend to consistently move across large geographic distances. These methods are further confounded by the fact that much of the species observation data that we use for these, me these methods are, are, uh, lack additional biological information such as age, sex, or breeding status. Based on these insights, I propose three specific modifications to the data preparation process of the traditional niche modeling framework to incorporate the temporal dimension without significantly convoluting the established workflow. These modifications address the problem of overgeneralization of environmental covariates and successfully reproduce dynamic niche predictions for both a seasonal migrant and a more problematic, problematic nomad. Further, these modifications open the door to incorporating environmental data into niche modeling analyses that were previously unsuitable due to their high variability, such as wind speed and direction, but can serve as major factors constraining a species' geographic distribution. So the ability to incorporate the temporal dimension into the established correlative niche modeling framework has far-reaching implications. 
First, the ability to estimate species niches in greater detail through time shows rich promise for illuminating migratory and nomadic movements of species through and between years. This ultimately will serve to facilitate a shift in biodiversity management towards more adaptive and responsive frameworks, such that protect protection is focused on important locations at the time when protection is most critical. So finally, temporally ex explicit model, uh, correlative modeling approaches can increase the overall usefulness of abundant open access prim primary biodiversity data. That is, through time-specific modeling in conjunction with prior knowledge of species biology, we may very well be able to tease out whether the individual observed at a given location and time is a breeding individual or not, a juvenile or full adult, male or female, and so forth. And it's my intention to continue investing, on, investing my time and energy working towards these goals going into the future and for much of my research career. Naturally, my ability to complete my doctoral research in less than a decade is the direct result of generous funding and support from a variety of sources, including KU's Biodiversity Institute, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and Office of Graduate Studies, as well as the National Science Foundation, JRS Biodiversity Foundation, and GBIF. I am incredibly grateful to my research committee for their guidance and their patience with my not always dissertation-oriented updates and endeavors, and in particular, I want to thank my advisor, T Dr. Town Peterson, who's been an amazing mentor and friend since my graduate school journey began in 2011. After nine and a half years in the Peterson lab, there are so many people that I've had the pleasure to work alongside and collaborate with, including lab mates, lab visitors, and the Ecological Niche Modeling Group. Sadly, I don't have pictures of everybody here. Uh, but here are just a few of the amazing friends and colleagues that have um, been my source of inspiration and support structure over the years. So thank you very much to each and every one of you. Finally, I'm eternally grateful for all the love and support and shenanigans of my family and friends over the years. Again, I by no means have captured everybody, but even if I didn't manage to squish your, your picture into my collage attempt, know that I appreci appreciate all of you. And for everybody that took time out of their day to listen to me, thank you very much. I now welcome any questions the audience may have, or you may commence with the heckling, whichever you may prefer. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.